Well, we're now in the second week of our message series that we're calling Gifts of Christmas. Every year at this time, the world explodes with symbols and images, songs and stories about Christmas time. The, the, the sights and the sounds and the smells are all around us and they flood our senses and for many they bring us a feeling of happiness and joy. But, but as much as most people love candles and candy canes and mistletoe and brightly lit Christmas trees, beautifully wrapped presents from Santa Claus and the merry colors of green and red, in this series we're actually exploring what those signs actually mean. Because most people have no idea that they all have a Christian background. So last Sunday, we started with the first symbol of Christmas. We took a look at the meaning of bells, church bells, Salvation Army bells, jingle bells, sleigh bells, songs about bells. You hear them ringing everywhere this time of year. And that's because bells are a symbol of faith. And they've always brought people together to worship God. And wherever people come together in faith, there is peace. And in fact, Christmas bells once even stopped a brutal war in its tracks. And so, the first gift of Christmas that we talked about last week are those holiday bells ringing through the land, reminding us to bring peace and goodwill to all the world. This week, we're going to look at the Christian history of another beloved Christmas tradition. But this one is rather obscure. You may not know anything about it. In fact, if you were to ask most people today, they would say that they've never heard of this tradition. So imagine, imagine a bitter cold and dark midwinter night. You're inside your Victorian mansion dimly lit with only a few candles to illuminate the night. A fire roars in the background and family members gather round with spirits in hand for some hearty and spine-tingling tales of a different kind of Christmas spirit. You know, the winter solstice is the coldest and shortest day of the year. It's a long night when some say that the realm of the spirit comes closest to that of the living. And so it's only natural that on that day our minds would turn to things like tales of the dead. That's right, telling ghost stories on Christmas Eve was once a very common tradition, especially in the 19th century. And in many of these ghost stories, there's a reason for the haunting Often it's to right a wrong that has happened or to pay a penance or the ghost needs to solve a mystery or simply just to scare the bejesus out of us. But often these frightening apparitions in these ghost stories would come with dire warnings. Ghost stories were often cautionary tales pointing out what happens when social norms are disregarded and ethics are violated. In fact, stories about ghosts tended to reinforce social customs and mores. Uh, I came across a a quote from um, a popular novelist in 1886 named William Dean Howells, and he wrote in a Harper's Magazine editorial that Christmas ghost stories reminded people of the old simple truths. It was to teach them that forgiveness and charity and the endeavor for life better and purer than each has lived are the principles upon which the world gets forward and holds together. And you know, the English writer Charles Dickens, he loved ghost stories, and he would include them every year in the Christmas edition of the magazine that he published. And many of those otherworldly yarns featured unhappy men who changed their ways after being visited by ghosts. In fact, the most famous Christmas ghost story ever was Dickinson's own novella, A Christmas Carol. You've probably read it or seen the play or watched the movie. The story recounts the remarkable conversion of Ebenezer Scrooge. 
He's a heartless, penny-pinching old man, and he hates Christmas because in his mind, his employees commit thievery by expecting a day off from work with pay once a year. And all the frivolity of the season, he thinks, just amounts to nothing more than an extravagant, unproductive waste of money. And to each person who wishes Scrooge a Merry Christmas, he responds with a crotchety, Bah humbug, exactly, you got it. And he refuses to contribute to charity or help the poor because the workhouses and prisons are exactly where they belong if they can't afford to pay their bills. Well, the story, as you probably know, begins on Christmas Eve and Scrooge returns alone to his dark and cold apartment after a full day's work at the counting house he owns. He consumes his usual repast, a plain bowl of porridge, yuck, and he changes into his nightgown and he gets ready for bed. But then something very strange happens. He is visited by the ghost of his dead business partner, Jacob Marley, who tells him that three spirits will haunt him that very night. The first one is the ghost of Christmas past, who takes Scrooge on a journey to the Christmases in his earlier life. And while watching these scenes, Scrooge eventually breaks down into tears of regret, realizing how his love of money has kept him from true love. Next, the ghost of Christmas present escorts him to the home of his employee, Bob Cratchit, and then later his nephew, and both families are celebrating Christmas and reveling in the good food and the holiday cheer, and Scrooge desperately wants to stay and join, but he is whisked away by the ghost of Christmas yet to come. And the phantom takes him to a lonely, abandoned gravesite. And while he's there, Scrooge overhears people discussing how awful the dead man was. And when he asks to show him the name on the tombstone, he is shocked to see that it is his. Scrooge then pleads with the wraith to alter his, his fate, and he promises to repent of his mean-spirited, selfish, and greedy ways, and to honor Christmas with all of his heart for the rest of his days. And instantly, he awakes, and it's early Christmas morning. He's overjoyed by the opportunity to redeem himself, and he rushes out into the street. He's greeting passers-by with hearty holiday salutations, and he sends a giant turkey to the Cratchit house, and he attends his nephew's party. And as the years go by, he holds true to his promise, and he honors Christmas with all his heart. He provides lavish gifts for the poor. He treats his fellow men with kindness, generosity, and warmth. Scrooge was grateful for being given a second chance. And you know, Advent, this season right now that we're in, the four-week period leading up to Christmas, is a time for all of us to repent, like Scrooge did, you know, it's actually supposed to be a penitential season, and you'd never guess that by the way we all kind of rush around and go into stores or now get online and buy a bunch of stuff and, and try to get everything done, and it just stresses us out, right? Getting our Christmas cards done, it's just stressful. I gave up on that years ago. But Advent really is supposed to be a time when we just wait in silence, and we try to reflect honestly on our lives and try to change where we need to. In the opening lines of the Gospel of Mark in the New Testament of the Bible, we hear about a man named John the Baptist who appeared in the desert and he was proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John's baptism was a call for the Jewish people of that time to repent. And guess what? They responded. The people of the whole Judean countryside and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. It was a huge success. So 
Why do so many of us today turn down that same invitation? Well, I suppose it's because turning our lives around, well, it's kind of hard work, right? And it's not all that easy. And there's a lot of emotional baggage that bogs us down. You know, the Greek word that's used in the New Testament for the word repentance, it just means to change your mind about something. You know, maybe change your mind about some way that you're living or some aspect of your life. But the problem is that many of us, if not most of us, come to consider repentance as kind of like a dirty word. <laughs> it's rather uncomfortable. You know, somebody says repent, and you're like, okay, that sounds really uncomfortable, and who are you to tell me that? Even just the word can stir up negative feelings of guilt and shame and remorse. And, and maybe, maybe you grew up that way. Maybe religion was used like a hammer to make you feel bad about yourself. You know, confession was a dreaded activity. You, you, maybe you imagine that the priest was pointing the finger at you and, and you thought God was angry and everyone was judging you, or worse, maybe you thought God didn't care whether you lived or died. And the whole idea of repentance just left a bad taste in your mouth. Maybe, maybe you still feel that way. But think for a minute about what it would be like if there were no occasion to change the error of your ways? What if your mistakes were indelibly inscribed on your soul? If every sin you ever committed was held against you? Think about that. Wouldn't that be awful? The, the result would be disastrous for every single one of us. The opportunity to change in midstream to be different from what we have been in the past, to improve ourselves in the future is actually a gift from God, especially in this Advent season. And whoever has made you feel bad about yourself, whether it was your parents or some priest or nun or just some religious nut, you need to get those voices out of your head. Because the Bible says that God is patient not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, when the people of Israel felt lost and alone and abandoned by God, which was quite often, he told the prophet Isaiah, God told the prophet Isaiah, comfort, give comfort to my people. He didn't say accuse them, condemn them. He said, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her service is at an end, her guilt has been expiated. These are not the words of a vindictive God or a God who doesn't care. These are the words of a deity who loves his people and would do anything to help them. And you know, at the time that Jesus lived, the Jewish people were again at a crossroads. It seemed like they were having trouble once again. And that was because they were under the domination of a foreign power, the Roman Empire. And there had been no great prophet to guide them for hundreds of years. And there were many conflicting movements and, and opinions. And the people felt abandoned by God, like he didn't care. But the passage from Mark today reassured them that God would soon lead them out of those difficult circumstances. Behold, God says, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. See, God is speaking to his people and he's telling them that he does care. He cares very much and he's coming soon in the, in the, in the person of Jesus and so they should be ready for him and so should we. Or, you know, maybe there's another reason that you don't like repentance. Maybe you avoid the whole process of repenting because, well, you think you won't be able to change. You know, if you try, you'll just fail and that'll make everything worse. Maybe you've tried before and it was a disaster. So you've come to accept your character flaws and you kind of hope everyone else around you accepts them too. And you tell yourself, oh, they're so ingrained in me that they're impossible to remove. 
that's just who I am, so why even bother? Well, you know, hundreds of years before Jesus came, the Jewish people were in yet another predicament. They seemed to get themselves in trouble quite a bit in the Old Testament. This time they had been exiled for a hundred years in a foreign land and they had lost hope then too. God had been absent for way too long and many believed that they would never make it home. And even if they were released from exile one day, many thought that the journey through the desert would just be too strenuous. They'd never make it. The mountains were too high, the valleys were too low. It just all seemed like an insurmountable obstacle. But here again, God reassures his people. He says every valley will be filled in, every mountain and hill will be made low. The rugged land shall be made plain, the rough country a broad valley. What he's saying is God is reassuring them that he will make the way home easy for them. And when they would be too weak to make it on your own, he even promises to feed them and carry them in his arms like lambs. You see, if you let him, God will remove every obstacle for you too. He will guide you home. And he will help you to change and become your best self. You no longer have to be ashamed. You no longer have to live this way. You no longer need to fear failure. God will make the journey back to him easy for you. Well, there's one more reason that you may put off repenting or changing. And that's because, well, you figure you've got plenty of time, right? Your attitude might be like that of the, of the fourth century saint, Saint Augustine. I love this quote. He says in a prayer, he says, make me good, Lord. Just not yet. <laughs> and for a lot of people, that's the truth, right? It's kind of good to be bad. And so we presume that God will be merciful at the end of the day. So why make the effort right now? But St. Peter warns in his letter that the day of the Lord will come like a thief and, well, then the heavens will pass away and the earth will be dissolved and then everything done will be found out. And since everything is to be dissolved in this way, St. Peter, in that reading, he hits us square through the eyes, square in the eyes. He says, what sort of persons ought you to be? You know, as punishment for his greedy and self-serving life, Scrooge's dead business partner, Jacob Marley, well, he had been condemned to wander the earth as a ghost for all eternity, weighed down by heavy chains. And when he visited Scrooge on that Christmas Eve, he was trying to save him from the same fate. But Scrooge was confused. He said to him, you are always a good man of business. Business, cried the ghost wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. Charity and mercy and forbearance and benevolence were all my business. The deals of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. So, how well are you taking care of your business? The business of humanity the business of becoming a better person. And you know, when I asked myself that question recently, I decided that I'm gonna work on something this Advent. I'm gonna work on my tendency to kind of get really discouraged when I experience failure at something. I'm gonna work on being less impatient with myself and with others when things go wrong and things go wrong all the time in church world. <laughs> That's going to be my business this Advent. I'm going to try to get better about that. But what about yours? Maybe you could take this privileged time to do a little soul searching about your real business. And you don't need to worry. God will comfort you. He will make the way easy. And he will give you all the time you need. Oh, and there's one added bonus. When you finally clear your conscience, you won't ever need to be afraid of things that go bump in the night. The second gift of Christmas, the healing power 
of repentance.